This recording is copyright. IELTS help now listening practice tests. Test 8. In the IELTS test you hear some recordings and you have to answer questions on them. You have time to read the instructions and questions and check your work. All recordings are played only once. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer discussing a holiday. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, sir. Can I help you? Yes. I'm thinking of going away on holiday, but I'm not sure where to go. Well, sir, we have a range of destinations that we offer. Are you going alone, sir, or with a friend? With my family, actually. So how many people is that, sir? My wife and I, and my young son and daughter. So four. So, four is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation, and answer questions one to five. Good morning, sir. Can I help you? Yes. I'm thinking of going away on holiday, but I'm not sure where to go. Well, sir, we have a range of destinations that we offer. Are you going alone, sir, or with a friend? With my family, actually. So how many people is that, sir? My wife and I, and my young son and daughter. So four. Fine. Now, with a young family, can I assume that you'd like to go somewhere warm? Oh, yes. A beach holiday. That's what we're looking for. Right. I'll just take some personal details, sir. First of all, what's your name? George Collins. Collins? Is that C-O-L-L-I-N-S? Yes, that's right. Thank you. And what about your wife and children? My wife's name is Jane. My boy's name is Mike. And my little girl is Jennifer. How old are the children? Mike's seven and Jennifer's four. Ah, they're quite small then. Oh yes, we just need a safe little place. A warm climate, a quietish, safe beach, a pool, preferably, and lots of small restaurants and bars near the hotel. Would you want any crash facilities in the hotel so you and your wife can get away when you want? No. I work quite hard, and I don't see the kids as often as I want at home, so I am looking forward to spending all my time with them. And what eating arrangements do you want? Just half board, please. We'll have breakfast at the hotel, but we'll eat lunch and dinner at a beach cafe. We'd want about four-star quality for the hotel, by the way. Right. And what time in the summer are you thinking of taking the holiday? I finish work on Friday night on July the 8th, and I'm off for two weeks, so I'll need to be back at work on Monday the 25th. I'll need to finish the holiday then on the 24th. And how long would you want to spend travelling? Oh, as little as possible, of course, with the little ones. Not more than a couple of hours in the car to get to an airport, and then not more than four hours on a plane. That's fine. You can get to all the nice resorts on the Mediterranean easily in less than four hours. Right then, let's show you some brochures. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. As I said, sir, most Mediterranean destinations are easily within your preferred flight time. You can choose really between Spain, France, Italy, the old Yugoslavia, Greece or Turkey, as well as the Mediterranean islands. Wow, what a great choice. What are the different costs involved? With you wanting a four-star hotel and pool, some countries will be definitely cheaper than others. Price-wise, Italy and France will be at the top end. Spain, Greece and Turkey will be at the low end. Greece and Turkey sound great, actually. I've always wanted to go there, and I've seen some beautiful photos. I think that Greece would suit you better, as the flight to Turkey is actually quite long. You're getting towards five hours there. OK. Well, Greece is fine. Of course, with Greece, you have the choice between the islands and the mainland. It's the islands that are famous, of course, but you'll have to get there by boat or take a short connecting flight. Some of the bigger islands are served directly, though, from UK airports. Well, one of the larger islands sounds best, then. What about Cyprus? I've heard that a lot of British people go there. Yes, it's very popular. The trouble for you with Cyprus, though, is that it's down in the eastern Mediterranean, near Turkey, and the flight is quite long to get there. I was thinking more of Rhodes and Crete. Let's have a look at those two, then. Here are some brochures. This is the Hotel Tropicana, and this is the Palm Hotel. Both of them are in Crete. In Rhodes, we have the Ocean Hotel and Hotel Spirits. Can you tell me a bit about them? Of course. The Hotel Tropicana is about one mile from the beach, and it's a safe walk along a path through some fields to get there. They have a nice pool, which you can see in the photo. There are only a few beach bars and restaurants, though. It's really quiet, away from all the bustle of other tourist destinations. The Palm Hotel is further from the beach, about two miles, but it has a minibus service that goes to and from the beach all day. The hotel itself is in quite a busy tourist town that has lots of bars, restaurants and discos. It's great for going out. I don't know if either of those suit us. We don't want noisy and we don't want a long way to the beach. Let's have a look at the Rhodes Hotels then. The Ocean Hotel is right on the beach. It's less than five minutes usually to get to the beach area from the rooms. The hotel is quite a long way from the main town and people usually take all their meals in the hotel. The hotel is four-star, though, and we know the food is quite good, as we've been told so by previous holiday makers. Hotel Spirits is a family-run hotel, also quite close to the beach. About five or ten minutes' walk. It's in a small village and has a small swimming pool as well. There are a few restaurants scattered around the village, but again, it's not a big tourist village, so there's not much to do. To be honest, both of those sound fine. We don't want a nightlife, as we won't be able to leave the kids. Something close to the beach, somewhere to eat, and sit in the evening is all we need. I've made some notes. Let me take the brochure with the details of these two hotels, and I'll take them back and show my wife and see what she thinks. They both seem just what we want, though. OK, sir. Come in again when you've decided, or if you want to see some other places. I will. Thanks very much, then. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a man giving an orientation talk to new holiday makers at the Solaris Hotel and Holiday Village. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully to the orientation talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone and welcome to your first morning here at the Solaris Hotel and Holiday Village. This little orientation talk this morning will just give you an idea of what to find and expect around the grounds. Let's begin by looking at meals. We have three different restaurants and you are at liberty to eat at any of them. They are the Harvest Restaurant, the Dean Restaurant and the Mekong Restaurant. Let's begin with breakfast. Breakfast is only served in the Harvest Restaurant. The other two restaurants are only open for lunch and dinner. Breakfast is served between 6.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. seven days a week. There are English, American and Continental style breakfasts on offer. For lunch and dinner all the restaurants have the same opening hours to make things easier for you. Lunch is served from 12 noon to 2.30 p.m. and dinner is served from 7 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. The menus are the same for lunch and dinner though look at the blackboards displayed in the restaurants for any specials that they are serving for any particular meal. The style of food is different in each of the restaurants. The harvest serves traditional English food though with plenty of the foreign dishes which are popular in the UK such as curry and spaghetti. The Dean specializes in fish and seafood and the Mekong offers you a selection of dishes from the Far East. Not just from Vietnam as the name suggests but Chinese, Thai, Malay and others. You don't have to pay in any of the restaurants unless an extra supplement is needed for some of the specials. All soft drinks are also free though we charge for alcoholic drinks. You can choose to pay any bill that you may incur at the end of the meal itself or you can put it on your main bill which you can pay when you leave at the end of your holiday. There is also a bar menu in the main bar which serves pretty good pub food and if you have any late night munchies there is a takeaway open until 2.30 a.m. which sells fast food. Good for those of you who are returning in the early hours from a disco or club. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the orientation talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Now let's look at some of the things that you can do here during your stay with us. Of course we have our main beach which is popular with everyone. There is also an adult beach which is prohibited to anyone less than 17 years of age. This allows those of you without children to get some peace and quiet on the beach. The main beach has two lifeguards on duty from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The adult beach has no lifeguards. If you don't like sand and salt we have a decked area in front of the harvest restaurant 
with our 25 meter swimming pool. You can lie here on a sun lounger and swim in the pool with no sand to bother you. There are steps from the pool area to the beach so you can go between the two but if you're coming up from the beach please walk through the foot pool so that the sand gets washed off and doesn't lie around the pool area. There are also fresh water showers available on the beach and in the pool area. As for sports, we have eight tennis courts and three squash courts, which can be booked at any time. There is a fully equipped gym with staff on duty to help you. No one under 18 years of age may use the gym though. We also have six full-sized snooker tables and five pool tables in the games room adjoining the bar. There is no charge for use of any of these facilities though there is a small charge if you need to hire any sports gear. Again, you can pay immediately or put the charges on your main bill. There are also water skiing and jet skis available, but there are charges for these. Go to the water sports office for details. All the water sports such as snorkeling, inflatables and pedalos are free. Ask for all details again at the water sports office. There is a library in the hotel which supplies books, magazines and newspapers. It has certain terms and conditions of use which you would be able to find on the notice board in the library. We also have two cinemas which show three different films every day. The showings are in the afternoons at 2 p.m., the early evening at 5.30 p.m. and at night at 8.30 p.m. The afternoon and early evening showings always have a film for kids. Children under the age of 16 are not permitted to attend the 8.30 presentations. Well, that's all for now. Are there any questions? That is the end of section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students giving a presentation to a seminar group at their university. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning all. Glad to see you're all on time today. This morning we're going to hear Jamie and Rebecca give their presentation on some aspect of demographics. They've talked to me about it a bit while researching it, but I don't want to give the game away, so I'll hand straight over to them. Hi everyone. 
As Dr. Rees said, Rebecca and I are going to give our demographics presentation. Both Rebecca and I also study languages, so we decided to look at the world's different languages and the ones that are the most important, both now and in the future. Rebecca's going to start off. OK, everyone. Who knows what the world's most spoken language is? I thought it was English, isn't it? Well, it's an ambiguous question. If you just look at how many individual speakers there are around the world, then the answer is Mandarin Chinese, with 836 million speakers. English was second until a few years ago, but it has since been overtaken by Hindi, with 333 million speakers, and Spanish, with 332 million speakers. Now English is after Spanish, with 322 million speakers. Oh yes, South America. I didn't think of that. Yes, it's easy to forget. You can look at Rebecca's question, though, in a different way if you look at the number of countries that use English. English is a massive 115, ahead of French, Arabic and Spanish, with 35, 24 and 20 countries, respectively. English has different statuses around the world. Core countries are where English has a full official status, like England, the US and Australia. In outer core countries, English has some official status, as in India. And then there are fringe countries, such as Japan and the UAE, where it's used a lot in business and tourism. A more important list is the world's most influential languages. This was compiled by weighing six factors, which were the number of primary speakers, the number of secondary speakers, the number and population of the countries where the languages are used, the number of major fields using the language internationally, the economic power of countries using the languages, and socio-literary prestige. And the list shows the following in order of the most influential. English, French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, German, Japanese, Portuguese, and Hindi. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the presentation and answer questions 27 to 30. How up to date are these figures? Fairly. They came out just last year. But the picture is changing very rapidly in terms of influential languages. There are certain large countries which are about to emerge on the world stage and their economies are starting to influence the world balance of power. The largest countries that for various reasons are beginning to shift world economic power are China, Russia, India and Brazil. The sizes of the populations, along with the cheap labour and raw material prices which are available in these countries, are causing this shift. As a result, every year the demand for people knowing the languages of these countries is growing enormously. In addition, the demand for teachers and English language training is also enormously increasing. Western teachers are going to the countries and their nationals are coming over here. As well as business, the education sector is getting a huge boost from the opening up of these economies. So, will China be the major powerhouse, as everyone says? Definitely, but maybe not the biggest. Many experts predict that India's population will soon surpass China's. Bangladesh's population could too. It all points to world economic power being held in Asia, though. English will probably remain important, though. Chinese is difficult to learn, and English also has some official status in India. English is easy to learn and has the advantage, for better or worse, of being the language that everyone wants to learn. That won't change in a hurry. How many people learn English, then? The number of spoken languages nowadays is estimated between 2,500 and 7,000. Out of all these languages, 
The numbers of those actually studied by non-native speakers is tiny. There are no official records of numbers studying English worldwide, but today you can safely say that there are not many countries with a structured programme of education where English is not taught. It will take a long time for this habit to be broken. At the moment it's getting stronger. That is the end of section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a humanities lecture on mad cow disease. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this humanities lecture. Today we're going to continue our look at the modern diseases that afflict society. We're going to look at quite a famous but rare disease. The popular name for this disease is mad cow disease. It's been so named because it's most often found in the brains of cattle. It attacks the nervous functions of the brain and leads to unusual behavior by the cattle. Thus, we familiarly say that the cow is therefore mad, and hence, mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is the commonly used name, but its medical title is bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE. It's a slowly progressive, degenerative, fatal disease affecting the nervous system of adult cattle. The exact form of BSE is not known, but it's generally accepted by the scientific community that the likely cause is an infectious form of a type of protein known as a prion. This protein develops abnormalities and apparently seems to encourage other proteins to become similarly misshapen, affecting their ability to function. In cattle with BSE, these abnormal prions initially occur in the small intestines, tonsils and central nervous tissues. There is a similar disease to BSE called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD that's found in people. A variant form of CJD is believed to be caused by eating contaminated beef products from BSE affected cattle. The abnormal prions in infected cattle products are consumed by humans as they are resistant to common food disinfection treatments such as heat. The disorder is rare, occurring in about one out of one million people. To date, there have been 155 confirmed and probable cases of CJD worldwide among the hundreds and thousands of people that may have consumed BSE contaminated beef products. Most of the cases have occurred in the UK. The one US case was in a young woman who contracted the disease while residing in the UK and developed symptoms after moving to the US. You now have some time to look at questions 36 to 40.
Now listen to the rest of the lecture and answer questions 36 to 40. CJD is a disorder involving rapid decrease of mental function and movement. As with BSE in cattle, these abnormalities are believed to be caused by damage done to the brain by prions, though it has been proved that in rare cases it can be genetically inherited. CJD tends to affect younger people, beginning between the ages of 20 and 70, with average age at onset of symptoms in the late 50s. Early symptoms include personality changes and difficulty with coordination. Once symptoms appear, the disorder progresses rapidly and may be confused with other types of dementia such as Alzheimer's disease. CJD, though, is distinguished by extremely rapid progression from onset to symptoms to disability and death. So, how did BSE and CJD come about? We've not read about them in the history books. These appear to be new diseases. BSE was first reported in the United Kingdom. The exact origins of BSE remain uncertain. But it is thought that cattle initially may have become infected when given feed contaminated with scrapie infected sheep meat and bone meal. Scrapie is a sheep prion disease similar to BSE in cattle. The scientific evidence suggests that the UK BSE outbreak in cattle was then spread by feeding BSE contaminated cattle protein to calves. Thus, we have created the disease ourselves. Cattle, naturally, are grazers, feeding on grass. We have given cattle feed derived from sheep, an unnatural food for cattle. We have compounded our mistake by also feeding young cattle with feed derived from older cattle, making them cannibals. There is a kind of horror associated with it when we look at it like this. There is also a kind of poetic justice that the disease is passed down to us as we consume the animals that we have infected. Moving on now, are there any questions with what I've said so far? That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test 8. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.